number 76, uh, Leland v. Bookhart. Good afternoon. Christine Gottlieb, NYU School of Law Family Defense Clinic for the appellant, Mr. Davlin Lalland. Your Honor, I would request two minutes for rebuttal. You have two minutes. Thank you. We are asking this court to join the growing chorus of high state courts that have held that the interstate compact on the placement of children does not apply to parents. The misunderstanding that it does has inflicted inordinate harm on children and families. The plain language of the compact states that it applies for placements in foster care and for potential adoption. And what, what's the source of that, what you're calling a misunderstanding and those regulations? Why, why, why has it taken that turn? I've given that a lot of thought, Your Honor. Um, it, what is clear is that the Association of Administrators, 40 years after the compact was drafted and after New York codified it, 40 years later, the administrators expanded the scope um, of what was under their authority uh, well beyond what the statute allowed. And once they did that, uh, departments uh, in some jurisdictions and courts in some jurisdictions uh, went with that regulation. I do not believe there's any doubt that if the families that we're impacting were not the marginalized, low-income families of color that it is, that there would have been stronger pushback immediately against that blatant misreading of the statute. Well, not all courts have agreed with you, right? I think Delaware didn't, and Delaware came up with something that says where the, non, where the fitness of the non-custodial parent is not in doubt, and no contributing, continuing supervision will be necessary, the regulations authorize the court to hold the compact inapplicable, right? Which I think actually mirrors an earlier version of the reg that wasn't adopted. What about a rule like that? Um, Your Honor uh, is correct. Delaware uh, is the one high state court that has um, found that the compact applies. Seven high state uh, courts have held that it clearly does not. In limited circumstances. Um, Your Honor, there's nothing in the plain language that allows limited circumstances. There's nothing in the legislative history um, that suggests uh, that it applies in limited circumstances. Um, and applying it contrary to its plain language is incompatible with New York's Family Court Act, which actually allows for an inquiry uh, into the non-custodial parent. Were there evidence of unfitness? So if you utilize New York's Family Court Act, can you get the same information that is sought by using um, the ICPC? You can get a great deal of information, Your Honor. What you can't get is that uh, receiving state's opinion, uh, a low-level administrator's opinion on what's best for the child. But of course, that isn't the standard under New York law. So what New York family courts can receive, um, and the first department um, made clear in matter of Emanuel B that there are many sources of information. So the caseworker interviews the parent, they interview the children, they can ask for a courtesy home study from the other state. If a courtesy home study is not available, um, they can get a private home study that can be retained or through a nonprofit agency. They can get information from the parent's employers, their landlord, their service so providers. So is it your argument that by utilizing those other sources, they can satisfy the requirement of rendering ultimately a decision in the best interest of the child? Your Honor, they can fulfill the mandate of the Family Court Act, which is that the family court judge here in New York assess whether that parent is suitable. No family court is going to send a child if they do not believe that that home is suitable. And I will note that there is uh, a right to a stay and, and uh, interim appellate review if anyone disagrees with that family court's determination. And very importantly, the family court under 1017 can hold a hearing to assess the information. And, and the problem with the compact is there is no hearing. The right. If the, once they determine in the compact in a negative way, the family's stuck with that decision. 
That's correct, Your Honor. It, there are months and months, if you're lucky, sometimes a year that you're waiting, and then the New York Family Court's hands are tied. They are not allowed at that point, if the compact is applied, to hold a hearing and assess the information. If they can't get the information that they need, is that a factor in determining it's not suitable to send the child out of state? Your Honor, the, uh, the courts have not yet determine the meets and bounds of what's suitable, but it's clear that the, the court can consider any and all information. But what about a lack of information? Can they consider a lack of information? Look, under the compact we could get this, but we can't order it, and we think there might be some involvement by social services needed in the destination state, and we can't order that, like we can't do that, so that makes our suitability determination go the, uh, unsuitable. So I think the concern about a lack of information would be addressed in a couple of ways. So one is at the 1017 hearing, the hearing held pursuant to the Family Court Act, Section 1017, as with all family court hearings, um, the parent's failure to testify could lead to a negative inference. Um, but what about an inability to check? They come in, they testify, but now I have no ability to check on what the circumstances are in the other state. Your Honor, there are many sources of that information. We need not rely on the other county. So in private custody disputes around the state, of course, New York state courts get plenty of information, even when they're sending a child in a private custody suit across state lines. Again, you can retain a private home study. You can get a nonprofit home study. And importantly, 1017 allows the Family Court Act to make orders against that parent. They have to submit to the jurisdiction of the court. And the Family Court Act, where the legislature, I, I think, really gave this serious consideration, they've amended 1017 five times in this century, indicating that they wanted to expand uh, the rights of these non-custodial parents. I just, excuse me, I just want to confirm something you said. In a regular Article VI custody dispute, one of the options available to the court in assessing the suitability, let's say it's an out-of-state parent, would be to do some sort of home study, either private or you could even ask the local social, social services agency to go to the home as a matter of courtesy. That's what you've argued so far, right? Correct. And your position is under 1017, all those options are still available without recourse to the ICPC. All of those and more, Your Honor, that's correct. So we don't have to hold that the ICPC is mandatory or even discretionarily available because there's another way to do exactly the same thing. Is that your argument? There's a way to get as much and more information, Your Honor, where, it's, where the family court's hands aren't tied. Um, and we're not delegating those decisions to, to these low-level bureaucrats. That's, that's correct. And, um, you know, I understand that uh, Amici, the New York City Administration for Children's Services, has it's invited this court uh, to grant discretion. But, but ACS itself acknowledges there's nothing in the plain language of the statute or the legislative history uh, that, that contemplates applying it to parents. Um, and there's, the compact is, a, is essentially a contract among the states. And individual states... So then, so then it's, it's your argument is really about the text and the history. And I understand the point about the history. The fact that the family court has other ways, other access to the information or some of the information in other ways maybe is of interest, but it, it doesn't, if I'm not misunderstanding you, you'll tell me, uh, or if I'm misunderstanding you, you'll tell me, it doesn't control here because what matters is just the text and the purpose of the compact at the time that New York entered this compact. Correct, Your Honor. The, the text rules and everything in the history supports the text and everything in New York statutory schemes supports the text. Um, but I do understand that any court is going to want to be assured that there is sufficient information and that's why we address that concern. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Good afternoon. I'm James Burnett, Assistant County Attorney, appearing for Dennis Cohen, the Suffolk County County Attorney. Um, I do agree with counsel using Family Court Act 1017 as an analysis because it does mirror basically the structure and purpose of the ICPC. Uh, the due process rights of a non-respondent out-of-state parent are covered in Family Court Act 1035, which says that these non-respondent parents, whether in state or out-of-state, have the right to notice, they have a right to appear at every stage of the proceeding, they have a right to seek custody. Those rights obviously have been met. I know there's some argument in the briefs that due process was not met, but due process was met in that the appellant did have notice and did apply for custody. The 1017 analysis, as counsel states, 
Uh, the court is directed to order the local DSS to do an investigation, report back to the court, and the court has to make a decision. In this case, I do think counsel overstates the amount of information that a judge in family court can get about a non-respondent. Can you give us an example of what would be available under the compact that a judge couldn't get under the Family Court Act? I think the information the court can get under the compact is the same that the court could get under an in-house, an in-state non-respondent parent because the local DSS office is going to go and investigate that parent. They're going to do the criminal background check. They're going to do the neglect history. They're going to see their home if it's inappropriate, whether they're living with inappropriate people or whatever the obstacles are to uniting a child with a parent, whether it's a respondent or not. Parents don't have, under the Family Court Act, a right to have the custody or the right to seek custody, which was granted in this case. If the respondent, or the, excuse me, the appellant in this case, had the ability to do private home studies, et cetera, that would be done. But these things are expensive a lot of times in family court. The parties aren't going to have access to the resources that they would in a Supreme Court divorce action or custody action. So I do think the only avenue that a family court judge has to obtain the kind of information it would get on an in-state or in-county non-respondent parent is going to be through the ICPC. So, so, I'm sorry, so I'm does that mean that if, if uh, I'm just going to assume exactly what you said, and I'll work from there, they can, they can dispute it, that if there was funding to do it, then you wouldn't have to go to the compact? You said it's costly and that's really the obstacle. I would agree. The, the purpose here, I mean, the ICPC does have a different function, which the states are agreeing that they are protecting themselves. So it's not solely a best interest of the child analysis. It's similar to the Indian Child Welfare Act, where because of the mistreatment of certain tribes in other states here in New York, mm -hmm. a tribe can just take jurisdiction over a neglect case, regardless of any kind of analysis, whether they have the means to prosecute it, or if the child's best interest would actually be served. But there's no analysis whatsoever. There's no decision. If that child is eligible for membership in the tribe, we're giving the, the tribes that right. Similarly, the states have, I assume there was a negotiation process and a bargain for agreement and the federal government was involved, but they agreed to these terms, which does include expressly an element to protect their own state interests, not just serve the best interests of the child. So that is a function. Yeah, but it begs the, the question of their state interests depending on what scenario. Right. No, the, the argument is that that doesn't apply. Child when it's an out-of-state, non-custodial parent, it applies for foster care and, and other kinds of a boarding house, that kind of thing. It doesn't apply to this situation. So I'm not disagreeing. You're absolutely right. Of course, yes, that's one of the purposes. The question is whether or not this interpretation is in furtherance of the purpose. I would, I would argue that <clears throat> it is mandatory the ICPC be applied. I don't think there's even an option really for discretion because that's not within the four corners. It either applies or it doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't apply, the family court is not going to have a lot of information or it's going to rely solely on the information provided by the petitioner in the VDOC petition. But going by, going by the language of the compact, it does apply, but it applies for adoption, adoptive and, and foster placements. It, it, that strongly suggests that there's a different weighing of the interests involved when you're talking about a parent. That, that does skip over, and I do realize we're talking about a different competing interest. You have, obviously, the parents' rights to seek custody, the parents' rights to raise their child. In this particular case, the scenario we have here, this was a parent who had never met the child. The child was born mm -hmm. um, outside of this parent. This parent was not, never a custodial parent. There had been a child support action. I don't know if that still a parent. motivation doesn't make any difference. I agree. Still a parent. That, that might be reason why he doesn't get custody. It's not a reason why you have to go to another state to find out the conditions. But that's really the only way the family court judge is going to get an independent analysis. Otherwise, you're relying on what that. So that then the first department is, is wrong in this analysis when they've said you have all these other means by which you can get this kind of information? I've been in family court for 20 years, and I do not see that kind of information coming in on these neglect cases. I do think when you have well-heeled parents and Supreme Court so action. They had tons biological. Of so that isn't that then, at the end of the day, getting back to an earlier point, that the, this turns on finances, not on the text and the purpose. I do it's think a cost cutting if, measure. I do think if the family court had some means, if the, but it's going to be similar to the interstate compact. If you're talking about somehow the court going to that local DSS out of state 
and getting information which county is suggesting, whether it's privately funded or publicly funded. Well, what about her argument that at least, yes, yes, I get what you're saying with that. But what about her argument that at least then you have a hearing at the court, there will be a, a New York judge's decision eventually on the issue. Well, Whereas out of state, it's just as she termed it, an administrator is going to make that decision. If you are going to apply the ICPC, the term says it's, there's actually punishment involved if you send a mm -hmm. child that's been refused by the yes. receiving state. So yes. your argument is that the biological parents are to be treated the same as adoptive and fosters? In terms of doing any kind of background check, that's as pretty much what the family court With respect to the act. mandatory requirement of the application of the ICPC. I do think it's, I, I appreciate the reasonableness of saying it might be discretionary because it does sort of balance the interests of the parent and the child. It does cut out the fact that the ICPC doesn't use the word maybe anywhere in the four corners, and this is a bargain for agreement between the states. So I really don't know that, I mean, obviously the court can define its terms any way it feels is appropriate and the best interests are resolving the issues. But um, I, I would think that given the way the statute is set up and that 1017, like I said, doesn't give parents a right to seek custody. It gives the parents a right to be noticed, or excuse me, the right to parents to seek custody, but not to have custody, which is the same thing that's being applied when you do the ICPC. These out-of-state parents have the right to be noticed, they have the right so to seek custody, no constitutional, and then local DSS. So there are no constitutional implications with respect to biological parents by applying this compact? If there were, it would already been addressed in the 1017 appeals because it's the same, it's really the same structure, the ICPC and the 1017, other than states have given themselves by agreement the right that it is a final. It wouldn't be this hearing element. It Can you speak final. to practically the delay issue raised by uh, your adversary? Can you tell us these cases under the compact versus custody proceedings under Family Court Act? What kind of time period are we talking about? An ICPC generally takes about one to three months, in my experience. I've been in family court for about 20 years, so I've seen several of them. About one to three months, depending upon how fast the receiving state acts, the local DSS, because everything has to go through the, the capitals. Everything has to go through Albany, whatever the capital the receiving state is. So there is a time, a delay element. And ideally, that would be the part that would be remedied if we were going to expedite the ICPC process somehow. I know you can't eliminate the capitals, but just somehow to increase the speed of communication because the home studies themselves don't actually take that long. I know that when the local DSS does a background check and a non-respondent parent, they can check the neglect registry very quickly. The police department usually responds within a week. What happens if it's a courtesy request, not an ICPC request? Uh, with respect to the question Judge Singus was asking, what's the delay inherent in that type of request? I've seen those flatly denied by other jurisdictions, so we have no control whatsoever, but there's no way to ensure that even happens. We can always make the request, but the local DSS isn't any kind of obligation, and if their caseload is full or whatever their situation is. Suffolk County, for instance, I don't know if you're aware of it, it's currently under a cyber attack, and I don't know how they're going to be able to comply with any kind of ICPC requests by other states at this point. They can't access their servers. Hopefully, they'll be resolved quickly. Now, what about Regulation 3? What's your position on that? Regulation 3 does, as the uh, judge was saying, uh, sp specifically refer to foster care situations. I do know that in the matter of Dale P., Your Honors, in the Court of Appeals, as the Court, I'm sure, is aware, Social Services Law 34 b which Dale P. refers to, addresses termination of parental rights. The county, having custody of a child, may or must file a termination after a certain period of time. Um, without discretion, but the issue is whether that applies to foster care. The language of 34B says it applies to children in certified foster care, but the Court of Appeals expanded that to include direct placement cases because they said it would not be fair to those children in direct placement to not give them the same opportunities for permanency, such as adoption, that a termination action filed by the county would provide. Similarly, the definition in, article, in Section 3 about the definition of foster care is limited because ICPCs can also apply in direct placement cases if a child's with a relative here locally in a neglect action and there's not a state parent who wants to apply, the court would still 
order or could order the ICPC to find out what that background information is and not just rely on self-reporting without a state parent. There are red flags raised if the child's removed. They decided at some point, these two parents, that this is the parent that's going to have custody and this is the parent that's alleged or found to have neglected or abused that child. Thank you. It does raise a red flag. Sorry. Thank you. We appreciate uh, that the department acknowledges that in the four corners, the ICPC either applies or it doesn't apply. There, there's simply no basis in the language for discretion. Um, we must disagree that due process is provided. Um, notice isn't all that's required for due process. It's the opportunity to be heard. That's what Mr. Lawland and these non-custodial parents don't have. They don't have the opportunity to be heard at a hearing um, by the family court who has the authority to make the decision. It's a non-reviewable decision. Um, and as the amicus and, and our brief indicate, they're denied for all kinds of reasons that New York would never keep a parent and a child separate. Counsel, but, I, one of the things I think you're hearing up here, and I speak for myself, like you're under, I understand your textual argument. I've made the, read the other cases that go that way uh, on the compact, but the concern is for the child, right, who's going into another jurisdiction now without this tool for gathering information available to the judge. And if you look at McCombs, which is cited many times in the various briefs, the facts of McCombs are terrible. I mean, McCombs is a special duty case. They sent the child to Philadelphia under supervision. It's the child is abused to the extent that it suffers permanent brain injuries, right? So that's a, a very good encapsulation of the risk, right, that, that we're seeing here. Um, and one of the things that strikes me as we talk about finances and fairness to the parent is to the child, if practically speaking, there's no ability to do this because of funding or whatever for a child whose family doesn't independently have the resources, isn't the burden of that rule falling particularly hard on the children of the families that you are asking us to, to protect? Your Honor, this, this court has said time and again that uh, the child's interest in almost all cases is to be with the parent and we're harming them if we unnecessarily put them in foster care. And we're not putting them at risk um, because the department's characterization of the information available is, is simply not accurate. Um, to say that you can't do these other home studies, it, counsel said he had never seen private home studies. I have certainly seen private home studies done. They can be done by a nonprofit. The family court can direct children's services to pay for a home study, which of course would be far less uh, of taxpayer money than the 10 years that we're now paying for foster care for Adriana. Um, and I, I also want to push back, Your Honor, the idea that these are typically done in one to three months. I've never seen one done in one to three months. And more importantly, the amicus brief from the lawyers who represent these children every day indicates that it's undisputed in, in the literature that they take far too long and we're just unnecessarily keeping children and families apart. Thank you. Thank you.